The key idea of bottom-up grounding to avoid the unnecessary rules we have seen in the last uh, section is to ground only rules that are relevant with respect to a gradually extending atom base. Now, we've already seen more or less the base case when looking at these unnecessary rules in our Hamilton and Cycle example, where we looked at the problem instance, which consists of seven facts of the edge predicate. And we more or less saw that it only made sense to produce rules that actually used um, instances of the edge predicate that are given in the facts. And those instances that used instances that used <laughs> instances of the edge predicate that were not among the facts were uh, redundant because they could never be applied, right? So that's more or less the idea. So we start with a set of facts, then, and keep in mind that we use safe rules. So this means all variables are in the positive body literals, and then we look whether the positive body literals of a candidate instance of a rule is in the atom base. If this is the case, this is a relevant uh, instance and we add it to our ground instantiation. But keep in mind, only at the beginning, the atom base consists of facts. After all, afterwards, we, we have to add heads of ground uh, rules because they can be used for further grounding. And these heads may or may not be true. So they are merely possible. Okay, now let's make this precise. Now to capture the set of ground rules that are relevant with respect to an atom base, we refine the notion of a ground instantiation that we have already seen in the introductory section, but now we parameterize it with exactly such a set of ground atoms. So this is now the definition. Again, we start from a non-ground logic program P. This is the one we want to ground, where we want to instantiate all variables. But now actually we have a parameter which is a set of ground atoms D. And this parameter helps us to identify among all the ground instances of P, the ones that are relevant with respect to D. Well, this gives us this definition here. Like before, we look at the ground instances of P, but only those that are relevant with respect to D. Okay, I'm turning a little bit around the definition, but now let's go for it. So what, what does it give us? We look at all ground rules of P such that the positive body literals are among the atom base. And keep in mind, since we look at ground rules, these are actually also ground atoms. And hence, it makes sense to check whether they occur among the ground atoms that constitute more or less the context that we have so far. Okay, so we've already seen in the, in the, when we looked at the example of the, of the Hamiltonian cycle, right, that we start with the facts. And in this way, we actually make sure that there is more or less also a derivation of these guys from the facts. Now, if we iterate this properly, we also make sure that all the rules that we accumulate in the iteration of this definition are more, have more or less a derivation via the positive rules, via the reduct from the facts. But this is again a bit hand-waving because this is not so clear from this definition. This is something we will see when looking at the algorithm, which we will do in a sec, before I have a second remark. So also keep in mind that we look at safe rules, right? So all the variables occur among the positive body literals. Hence, once we have an instantiation of the positive body literals, uh, we have more or less an instantiation of the whole rule because all variables have received uh, terms from the term universe. Okay, now let's, let's actually, let me zip this one and let's look at the algorithm that we obtain by using this definition. Our bottom-up grounding algorithm can actually be seen as an iteration on the relative ground instantiation. We start with an atom base that consists of the facts, or more precisely the heads of the facts, uh, then compute the relative ground instantiation with respect to the facts. Normally we actually obtain a uh, new rules and we take these heads because they can be used for further grounding, add them to the atom base and continue in that way until we cannot extend the atom base anymore. And then we output the relative grounding or the relative ground instantiation of the logic program with respect to this final atom base. Okay, let's make this precise. So we implemented this behavior with a function called, surprise, surprise, ground bottom up. And this function takes two parameters, the original non-ground logic program and the atom base. But keep in mind, while the atom base will be increasing over time, the ground, uh, the non-ground logic program will remain the same and mainly act as a parameters. 
So, okay, now to get the intuition here, let's perhaps start with the very first call to this procedure where we have our non-ground program plus uh, the atom base that is comp composed of the heads of the facts given by the problem instance. And keep in mind there's a difference between facts and atoms, hence I just stress this, that we call it with the heads of the facts. And now I zip it on that. Okay, now what we then compute is the ground instantiation of our original program relative to the facts, which is not completely correct, but I think intuitively clear. And we get here a bunch of, of rules. And well, normally uh, these rules produce heads that we have not yet seen in the, in the problem instance, hence these heads are not, contain, not, are not contained in our atom base. And then we add them actually to our atom base and we more as loop and now uh, look at the ground instantiation with a larger atom base when we enter this again. Now we do this, we loop more or less on this until we cannot produce any new heads anymore. This may be because simply the ground instantiation doesn't change anymore or perhaps there is a redundancy anyway. So when, when we get a fixed point on the second argument, that is when the, when the atom base is not uh, augmenting anymore or cannot be extended anymore, then we, we take the ground instantiation of the program with respect to this last atom base uh, and since this here fails, then we return uh, the, this ground instantiation. We pop all the recursive calls and in the end return this ground instantiation as the result of our algorithm. And the good news is this, com this program is equivalent to our original program P together with um, the um, problem instance or the facts that we use to initialize things. Let's make this precise here. So given a non-ground safe normal program P, and the set of ground facts, the problem instance, so P is more or less our encoding and I is our problem instance, then the encoding together with the instance, and keep in mind that the encoding is the non-ground part and the instance is normally the ground part, so this non-ground program is equivalent to the ground program obtained by, our, by, by applying our bottom-up grounding procedure to the program, the heads of the facts along with the problem instance. And equivalent means here that this guy and this guy, so more or less our non-ground program consisting of the encoding and the facts, yield the same stable models as the ground program produced by this call here. Okay, so this makes sure that our procedure is sound and complete so, uh, and, and produces exactly the instantiation that we want and hopefully with less redundancy. But to convince ourselves of this, let's come back to our example. For illustrating the bottom-up grounding algorithm to you, uh, I'll be showing you the uh, ground rules obtained at each iteration on our example, the Hamiltonian cycle a problem. And the set of um, ground rules obtained at each step is driven by this condition. That is, we only obtain ground rules whose positive body literals belong to the atom-based accumulated so far. And keep in mind that the atom base keeps growing. Accordingly, also the relative ground instantiation, the ground instantiation with relative to the atom base keeps growing accordingly. Okay, but that was just the setup. Let's now finally get to the example. So in the very first iteration of our grounding algorithm, we can only produce ground rules whose positive body literals correspond to the facts in our example. So these rules, these ground rules are listed here and the positive body literals are highlighted in yellow. So keep in mind that the first type of non-ground rule originally produced 16 ground instances because we just systematically uh, looked at all combinations of our four nodes with each other. While now actually things are driven by the existence of edges, right? Remember we have seven edges in our example, hence we get seven uh, ground instances of this particular rule. And in the, same, in the same way or analogously, we get this for the second type of rule. So here we talk about edges being on the path unless they have been omitted. And here about edges being omitted unless they have been on the path. So this already gives us quite a reduction from 16 to 7 in each case. Actually for the remaining ones, for the four integrity constraints of each type, uh, we get 
the same number of instances as before and the same actually with this rule with, with this last rule which tells us that the start root the not the start root the start node is also reachable Anyway, so this is an explanation actually on, on how this relevance criteria already helped us to remove redundant rules from the from redundant ground rules from, from, the, from the grounding. But the and the other thing we have to observe that now we also produce new atoms that have to be added to the atom base. So the new atoms in our case are these seven instances of the path predicate and seven because they, they correspond to the seven possible edges we may actually um, traverse, and accordingly seven, uh, seven uh, instances of the omit uh, predicate. Of course, integrity constraints do not produce any heads, but here we get yet another one, that is we have reach of A as another new member of our atom base. So our atom base now consists of the 12 original facts plus seven, plus seven plus one and this is our new atom base and now in the second step we ground relative to this augmented atom base. The second iteration of our bottom-up grounding function yields all ground rules whose positive body literals belong to the atom base obtained in the first iteration. Now this means actually that we now recompute uh, all ground rules uh, computed in the first iteration plus the ones that result from uh, the heads of the ground instantiation obtained in the first iteration. Like for instance, uh, the instances of the path predicate here, right? So again, so don't be misled by, by this set of rules because this also includes the rules obtained in step one. And this will be like this in all the steps. Okay, anyway, so the first interesting thing is that uh, the original integrity constraint of this bunch here and the original rule of this bunch uh, both contained three variables. So if we just systematically grounded things, we obtained in both cases 64 uh, ground rules. So we uh, instantiating one variable with four nodes, the other with four, and then with four. This gives us 64 possibilities, right? So now we obtain for the integrity constraint uh, only six instances and for the rule only 12 instances. So the reason why we get here 12 instances is because here we more or less talk about all path of lengths 2. So one edge and another edge and these are these may be on the on our chosen path and this is actually how we then generate 12, uh, 12 possibilities that A, B, C or D are on the path. Okay, in fact if we had not implemented the inequality here by a strictly equal, we also had obtained here 12 rules, but uh, you can think of this a little bit. This is a, a simple way of symmetry breaking, because if we had written here an unequal symbol, we had obtained each integrity constraint twice just by reversing the roles of, of, the, of the corresponding nodes. Anyway, some food for thought. Good. So the other nice thing is uh, to observe a little bit how the reach predicate develops because we have seen in the first iteration that the, the starting node was reachable, hence we, uh, we obtained the, the atom uh, reach one. And since the reach predicate itself is defined recursively, we actually obtain at each iteration new possible instances or new ground rules that uh, provide alternative ways of deriving uh, instances of, of, of the reach predicate. Right? So before we obtained reach of A, here we now obtain reach of B and reach of C. And so, in addition, we have then on pass A, B, and C, and these are the atoms that we now add to our atom base before we launch the third iteration of our grounding function. Here are now the new rules obtained at the third and fourth iteration of our bottom-up grounding procedure. And, uh, well, given that reach of B and reach of C was added to the atom base at step two, we can now form uh, these four uh, ground rules here. And again, we already had reach of A and reach of C in our atom base, but the new atom now is reach of D. And with it, we can now form in the next step this ground rule here, which gives us yet an alternative way of deriving reach of A. And in fact, there is yet a fifth iteration, but in the fifth iteration, uh, no new hats will be derivable. And 
hence the procedure will not do another iteration. It will just return the ground instantiation relative to the last atom base, right? The base that we had at, at step four. And this will be returned as the result of grounding our example program, our Hamiltonian cycle instance. Okay, so let's sum up the properties of our bottom-up grounding procedure. The distinguishing feature of bottom-up grounding is that it only produces ground rules that are relevant with respect to a given atom base. And the resulting property actually is that all the positive body literals of these resulting uh, ground rules have a non-cyclic derivation that is rooted in the facts, ignoring the negative literals. Even though more or less we so far were or are only interested in the resulting ground instantiation of a, of, of a program, the final atom base gives us actually an upper approximation of all the atoms that could be in a stable model. If an atom is not in the final atom base, it can never be in a stable model because it would not have a, deriv a non-cyclic derivation, right? Okay, so this is already, I think, uh, quite a nice uh, um, property or quite a nice feature of, of our bottom-up grounding. But on the other hand, we've all also seen that there are disadvantages. And one, of course, is, and perhaps the slides have been a mis bit misleading because I only showed the new ground rules at uh, each step. But after all, this procedure regrounds the rules from each previous step. So there's quite some redundancy still involved. So we get less rules as a result, but we keep producing several copies of them, at least in this naive, or, well, it's not, not so naive as at the beginning anymore, but it is simple uh, algorithmic approach. The other thing we have seen is that it performs no simplifications. So notice that we actually derived at the very first iteration that uh, node A is reachable, since uh, it is actually the starting node. And later on, we kept deriving alternative ways of, of deriving reach of A, even though it was obvious that these rules are redundant because we could already establish reach A as a fact, given that start of A is a fact and we have the rule reach of A if start of A. Okay, anyway. So there's quite some room for improvement and there are actually ways to do that. The ways of improving bottom-up grounding also provide us with an agenda for the upcoming sections. The first technique that we will be looking at will actually reduce the regrounding at each step. So the idea is more or less that we exploit the dependencies among the rules in a program and partition the rule into different sub-programs. And these sub-programs depend upon each other, similar as we have seen with, the, um, with gradually extending the atom base, right? So we ground the first sub program, this gives us an atom base, then we ground the second sub-program, etc. So since we work with, with graphs, these sub-programs are also referred to as components, and the grounding algorithm will then uh, work successively on these components, but apply bottom-up grounding on each component separately, and thus not reproducing ground instances from previous components. A second refinement in particular for the recursive case, like the, we've seen uh, uh, the, the definition of the reach predicate was recursive, is to adapt the technique from the database uh, field. And this is called semi-naive evaluation, where the idea is at each iteration to only take into account what was new at the last iter uh, iteration. And this allows us to reduce even more redundancies, in particular when we deal with recursive rules. Last but not least, we will look also in a section yet to come at simplifications on the logic programs. Uh, so one thing is to remove literals from bodies once they have been found to be true or false, right? And uh, similar to omit rules once one knows that the body will never be applicable or even that not even to produce a rule if, for instance, the head of the rule was already found to be a fact or true, right? Now, this is our agenda. Now, we will now look in this uh, section at the very first technique here and, and see actually how we can exploit a program's dependency graph to compartmentalize uh, our grounding procedure. So stay tuned. As just mentioned, our first idea is to exploit the dependencies among the rules in a program to avoid regrounding rules at each step. So to be a bit more precise, the idea is to take a non-ground logic program and to partition it into a sequence of sub-programs so that then the grounding, actually bottom-up grounding, can be applied to each of the sub-programs uh, 
one after the other, uh, where more or less you only get the atom base of the previous subprogram and do not have to care about grounding the rules in the previous subprogram anymore. So this is more or less the strategy to avoid then regrounding of rules. Okay, but to this end we first have to see what dependencies are there and how can we exploit them. And for this we have to make precise uh, some concepts. So the first one is a dependency graph. Actually, dependency graph is something that you, actually all these ASP systems establish upon parsing, that they have a, a global view on the program. Well, here again, keep in mind, we have a non-ground program at hand. So we have variables in the program and we want to talk about the dependencies. Okay, here the idea is to say that a rule R2 depends upon a rule R1. If there is an atom in the body, either the positive or the negative body of R2, that unifies with the head of R1. Keep in mind that we need unification because we are only interested in whether the head and this body atom can be made equal, right? That's the idea. Good, and then we say actually that R2 depends on R1. Good, now that we have this dependency relation, we can build from this uh, a graph, and this is then the dependency graph of the program. This is this guy here. The nodes are all the rules in the program. Keep in mind, non-ground rules. And the edges are induced by all the dependency relations. And I just wanted to point out that if a rule, if a rule R2 depends on R1, we represent this by an arc from R1 to R2. And you know, I think this is, if you, if, if you are used to, 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 to ASP and dependency, I think this makes sense. Because normally, actually, the body depends on the derivation of a head from another rule, right? So the dependency is somehow directed from bodies to heads. But if you then want to build a sequence of subprograms, you want to start from the facts and then keep on going, right? And, and if you look at this just from a fact perspective, if, if R1 would be a fact, right? and the atom in the head of the fact appears in the body of another rule, then you want to have first the fact and then the rule in which the head of this rule appears in the body. Well, I zip it now again, uh, just to explain a little bit why the dependency is defined from the body towards the head, but then in the graph you normally use the other direction. Again, in the literature you will also see this varying, and I hope that we are consistent here in the lecture, just to warn you. And I'll zip it again. <laughs> anyway, so this is the general dependency graph of a program that reflects positive and negative dependencies depending on whether the body, this body atom appears in the among the positive or the negative body literals. Now, one thing we are also interested in is the restriction to the positive dependencies. And this is then called the positive dependency graph. And then a rule R2 depends positively on another rule if the body atom uh, appears in the, among the positive body literals and the rest is more or less the same. And we get a similar concept. We have then here, the, we indicate that, it, that we deal with a positive dependency graph by adding a plus here. And then the graph is built in the same way, just that here we look at positive dependencies and not about general dependencies. Okay. So anyway, I don't think it's much worse that I explain more. Perhaps you just look at the slide and, and, and do some examples. So what we have now are these two dependency graphs, the general dependency graph and the positive dependency graph, and we will now use them to partition our logic program. For this we exploit some more concepts from graph theory, namely the strongly connected components of a direct gra directed graph. Again, if you're not familiar with this concept, Wikipedia uh, can help you. Otherwise, let me just give you a brief overview, notably the motivation of why we look at these guys. Okay, now, first of all, what is a strongly connected component? It's a subgraph in which each node is reachable uh, from any other node. So more as you can find, you, you pick uh, two nodes in, in, this, in, a, in a strongly connected component and you will always find a path between them, right? So these are the strongly connected components. The nice thing is once you have all the strongly connected components of a directed graph and you collapse each strongly connected component into a node, then this graph is acyclic. So you may start from, from a cyclic dependency graph, then you build all the strongly connected components, collapse each of them in one node and the, the graph that you get is acyclic. And then actually graph theory tells us that whenever you have an acyclic graph, you can always 
order its nodes into a total order. And this is called a topological order. Okay, this is actually what we are interested in. We want to look at topological orders of strongly connected components. So again, keep in mind, each strongly connected component represents a subprogram. And in this subprogram, there may be circular dependencies, right? But if we now take the components as such, as nodes, we can actually order all of them. We can thus order all the subprograms into a total order. And this is called a topological order of the strongly connected components. Okay, and here, for instance, we are interested in such a topological order, and these components C are now subprograms. So, well, um, some of course a strongly connected component is a subgraph, but here we only look at the nodes of the of, of the strongly connected components. And this topological order respects the dependencies, right? So if there is a dependency between two rules and the first rule appears in a component and the second in another, then following this dependency, the first component must appear before the other component or must be the same component in this topological order, right? So this topological order is compatible with a dependency among the, the, the rules. Good. So this, so far, actually, what we can do now is we can take a non-ground logic program, compute the dependency graph, and partition it into subprograms. And each subprogram is um, a strongly connected component of the original graph. And we also get a sequence of these subprograms by looking at the topological order of the strongly connected components. Actually, we go one step further because here we have the st strongly connected uh, components of the general dependency graph. Now we we look again and try to partition these guys here depending on their positive dependencies. And so we, for each for each of these uh, subprograms, we look at the positive dependency graph and we again get a topological ordering. And now we can con concatenate all these topological order orders of with respect to the uh, the original strongly connected component and we get one refined topological order and this is again a sequence of subprograms right so each of these ci's is actually are the nodes of the strongly connected components these are rules so this is a subprogram and this and all of them are subprograms and they are obtained by following the order of the strongly of the strongly connected component on two levels right okay now this was a lot of Formalities again, I think if you're familiar with these concepts, because I think such things like Tayan's algorithm, how to compute such strongly connected components, are normally in computer science taught and on the undergraduate level, then I think this should all be crystal clear. If not, Wikipedia is your friend. Okay, now let's look at our example. Let's return to the Hamiltonian cycle and let's actually see how our topological ordering of the strongly connected components of our example look like. So here is the dependency graph of our Hamiltonian cycle encoding. Recall that we have nine rules and each rule is a node in our graph and this is indicated by a rectangular box, right? Then we have a dashed and solid lines and the dashed lines are negative dependencies and the solid ones are positive dependencies. So more or less the, 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 the edges in the general dependency graph is the union of both type of edges, right? So for instance, this rule depends on this rule here negatively uh, because the head of this rule appears here in the body. In the same, in the same way, this rule, here, uh, this rule here depends positively on this rule because the head of this rule occurs here and here in the body. But you see from the order of derivability, it makes sense to have the arcs in this direction because this guy derives actually an instance of omit and this occurs here in the body. Okay, so this gives us, first of all, the dependency graph. And now we can look at the strongly connected components. And actually we see that, except for this guy here, all of them are singleton uh, components, so components that contain a single rule. So they are perhaps not so ex exciting. So this, here we actually have a strongly connected component that consists of two rules. And we see the reason for this, because this rule depends on this rule and vice versa. And uh, it's only when we drop the negative dependencies, we only look at the positive dependencies, then we 
then these rules are independent of each other and hence we can order them. We can order them in this way or in the other way around. So we get both topological orders, refined topological orders are possible, right? Okay, so this is um, more or less the, uh, our example. Um, again, there's not perhaps, well, there are a couple of things perhaps also to mention. Look, here for instance, we have a recursion, right? So this rule depends upon itself. And also this rule, oh, this rule also depends on this rule. There is an arc from here to here. So reach can, this, reach allows us to derive this positive uh, body uh, literal. And of course, since we have reach in the head and reach in the body, there's also the recursion here, right? So otherwise, I think um, there's not much to say about this example, but let's see a little bit how we can use now these dependencies to uh, ameliorate our grounding procedures. Now, by exploiting the topological sorting induced by the dependencies among the rules, we obtain this grounding algorithm. As before, the algorithm is initialized by our problem encoding and the facts extracted from the problem instance, or more or less the atom base that corresponds to the facts in the problem instance. And then we loop here over all components in the topological ordering. And keep in mind that each such component here represents a subprogram, and the whole topological ordering is a partition of the, the initial program P, right? Okay, so the ground rules are accumulated in this variable G, which is initially set to the empty set. Then we start with the initial component and use actually our bottom-up grounding algorithm to ground this subprogram with respect to the initial atom base. We obtain a set of ground rules, they are accumulated here and the atom base is augmented by the heads from this first round of, of, of grounding. Now when we go to the second component, again we use our bottom-up grounding function, but now again we apply it only to this component. And in this way we proceed component-wise and do not reground rules that we have already investigated in, in a previous round. And this is actually the trick that saves us from reproducing uh, ground rule at each step that we did before in our first bottom-up grounding procedure. And once we have iterated, oops, I'm sorry, once we have iterated over all the, the, the components in the topological ordering, we return the ground program or the ground instantiation of the program and we're done. Okay, sounds pretty good. Anyway, again, we have a nice uh, soundness and completeness result saying that if we have a, a non-ground, safe normal program and a set of facts, so more or less a, a, a problem encoding and a problem instance, then the stable models of the problem, the original non-ground problem encoding and the problem instance are the same as the stable models of the ground logic program obtained from our grounding procedure. And again, we have here the problem encoding, here we have the heads of the uh, problem instance and we add here the facts of the problem instance, right? And this establishes more or less that this is sound and complete. Okay, let's look at an example. As an easy example, let us just see how our grounding function treats the very first two components in our example. So keep in mind that each component consists of a single rule. The first one saying that edges that are not on the pass are omitted. And we've already seen that this rule yields seven uh, instances one for each edge in our example. And that's exactly what we obtain here. So apply, iterating over, the, over the, the components, we first apply bottom up grounding as we have seen it before to the very first component C11 and we obtain seven ground rules. Now when we are about to ground the second uh, component, we apply again bottom up grounding, but now only to the non ground root in the second component. And remember, there is a, a single one which says for each edge, if it is not omitted, it must be on the path. And this is the only rule we consider. So we use, of course, in this case here, we don't really use it, the atom base we have calculated for the first component, but we only concentrate on the non-ground rule in the second component. There's a single one for which we obtain seven ground instances as we've seen before. So here actually we produce seven rules and again seven rules. While before, if we apply bottom-up grounding to all of this, we obtain seven plus 14 because we would have in the second step 
uh, reproduce the ground rules of the first step. So this is now completely avoided with bottom-up grounding but restricting it to each individual component. So this is the cool thing here. If we now extend bottom-up grounding but to follow the topological uh, um, sorting or ordering, we have no regrounding if there is no positive recursion in a component. Unfortunately, once we have positive recursion, and you may remember our component uh, C71, there actually we have recursion and we apply bottom-up grounding on this component. And of course, here we duplicate things again. So it's in, in the first step, we get these two rules because before we, at, at some point, we, we, we derived that A is, is reachable and we have these pass thingies. But again, since we apply bottom-up grounding to this component, in the second step, we produce these two along with these four. And in the third step, we produce these two again, these four again, and this guy. So in a way, we have less regrounding, but the trick of applying bottom-up grounding only component-wise only works for non-recursive components. Because within the recursive components, we face the same redundancy because again, we apply bottom-up grounding component-wise, and then within the component, we just proceed as we proceeded before. Now, but again, there's, a, there's a, a technique or a trick to deal with this, and this trick comes from the field of database theory. It's called semi-naive grounding, and this is what we will be talking about in section three. So, stay tuned.